Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Sam Joyce, and today I have the great privilege to be speaking with retired financial advisor, current host of the My Millennial podcast, and author of Sort Your Money Out and Get Invested, Glenn James. Welcome to the show, Glenn. Hey, Sam. Thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to be able to speak to you today. Uh, Personal finance is a bit of a new interest and hobby of mine, so I'm really excited to hear all of your great advice and wisdom. Uh, And the really interesting thing that I want to talk to you about first is that you're actually the host of this amazing podcast, My Millennial Money, which has a massive community around it as well. So I was really fascinated to hear that you have this book coming out and I wanted to know why was the book the next step for you? Yeah, it's a, um, for me, it was a, almost a logical step. Although it's interesting, I must confess, um, I would like to really thank the publisher for helping me because I'd had a book skeleton written for about four years. So like the structure and all that. And I had in, and Wiley approached me and said, Oh, do you want to do a book? I'm like, I've already got it. And they're like, all right, we'll send it through. And I'm like, all right, well, I've got, you know, maybe half a chapter. So it was, um, it was more of a logical step for me. I'd needed the accountability for somebody else and we can swing around to accountability with our money. Um, but just having that third party accountability, the community really wanted to have a book in their hand. Like everybody can access a podcast with all different random topics, but a book does a lot of things. It will methodically take you down the garden path in a specific order and you know you can highlight it and i i was really um encouraged to see that books aren't actually dead uh they're far from it and (laughs) yeah um, you know it's just it's fascinating um to see the response from uh the listeners of the podcast to you know reach out and, and grab the book and to really get excited about it yeah there's definitely something comforting and reassuring about having, you know, a step-by-step resource, having it there for you to pull off the shelf whenever you need, being able to flip back and forth pages and even have it there while you're listening to something or while you're looking at, you know, something else, reading an article, you know, did they say the same thing or are they saying something different as well? Um, And, you know, I think it's really fascinating that you say as well that the community is really, you know, excited and looking for this. And of course, I think being a millennial myself, I can appreciate that. And I think that I'm in the same boat there, but um, why do you think it's important that millennials in particular and Gen Z's and other people in our sort of generational era are able to hear financial advice from someone in that same boat? Yeah, well, it's funny. A lot of people like a lot of people listen to our podcast who aren't millennials, for example, and Ah. you know, we've got uh, Gen Z that listen or Gen Z, whatever it is. We've got people over age 50, like into the boomer generation. And what Mm. I like to kind of say is there's no money law that, you know, doesn't apply to any age. Like it's the same law for every age and I'm a millennial and this is the way I speak. So the delivery is different. The language is different, but there's no, yeah, you can't get around it. You can't get around living on less than you earn. You can't get around to, Mm. um, you know, the basic laws that apply, like gravity applies to everybody. Um, so yeah, so it's basically a language thing, uh, but we welcome anyone to listen. Yeah. I also really love it because I like hearing people who, I guess, see the the current situation maybe in a similar way. Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious that, uh, you know, our situation might be different from several generations ago. Dollars don't go the same way, don't stretch as far potentially, or, you know, maybe goals are different. Uh, and lifestyles are different. So having financial advice and hearing that from someone who understands that intimately, I think is really important. And, you know, I wanted to ask you as well, because you have, there's a lot of people in the market, you know, giving financial advice, uh, whether that's through books or through TV shows. Um, I can think of a couple of big names who have, you know, TV shows that are all about um, giving financial advice to people, but is it all the same, you know, considering people's different backgrounds? Yeah, it's, it's funny that I think like if you look at an analogy of if you go to a doctor with a condition, mm. three different GPs may give you a different type of treatment or a style of treatment that will get you to wholeness and wellness. Uh, so I think mm. it does come down to uh, a particular style of teaching. 
uh, within the laws of um, money, like you go to a specialist, one might give you one um, approach to an operation, another might give you the other, you'll get healed or whatever. So it does come down to uh, the teacher's personal preference, the teacher's personal view of the world. And ultimately, you know, if you don't like, you know, the one person over there and what they're saying and the way they say it, you might like another person. Like every time I pick up the microphone, um, I acknowledge that I can't please everybody. I'm not chocolate. So it's, um, it, yeah, it, it just, it's a style. And I think yeah. like anything, we need to connect with people that we relate to and we need to connect mm -hmm. to people that we are, are encouraged by, uh, and the underlying, um, you know, laws of money will be the same. Yeah. It's, it's fair to say as well, people learn in different ways too. Some people much prefer to hear and listen um, to, to something and other people like to sit down and read and highlight as they go. Uh, so it's probably good then to have this, this additional resource as well. Personally, I like to listen, but I, I'd like to have that extra resource because I think I take things in better when I have something written in front of me as I'm hearing it. So do you yeah. think that people might start doing that? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's funny. Like, so I, I think in the introduction of um, the book, I write that, you know, I hate reading, so I listen to audiobooks. Mm -hmm. But I'll often right. uh, listen to an audiobook and then still buy the hard copy, even, you know, yeah. $20, $30 or whatever on a book, just for me to have that, to go to the tables or the diagrams that the person is talking yeah. about, just so I can highlight it. Um, yeah, yeah I, I just find value in that because I'm a visual learner and, you know, I didn't do that great at school because I wasn't good at um, listening, remembering and regurgitating in an exam. But mm. if the teacher got the whiteboard out, drew concepts, I would absolutely understand it and get it. And the way that I wrote mm. this book was for people who needed that extra visual aid and for example like every chapter has a tldr at the start so if you just want to mm. know what's in the chapter here's you know 10 bullet points of yeah. what we'll cover and if you're not interested in it well don't read it so um yeah i did really try and write it for people like me who might not have uh the best attention span uh and who need diagrams there's lots of diagrams there's, there's lots of charts there's lots of tables mm -hmm. uh because I've written this book in a way that I want the penny to drop for people to understand uh, some of the complex topics and I have really try and make them easy. Mm. Yeah. All right. So speaking of the book, it is sort your money out and get up and get invested. Can you tell our listeners a quick summary, a little bit about what is the book and why did you write it? Who is it for? Yeah. So primarily it is everything that I teach um, to get people to a base camp to be started, to be invested. And, you know, my aim with anything that I teach is that you outgrow that and you adapt my concepts to your own situation. And I wrote it for a couple of reasons. One, because I was sick of, uh, explaining to my friends as well. Like when they asked me, Oh, what do I do? I could just be like, here, have the bloody book go away. Like, so <laughs> it's that kind of cheeky, like here's everything I'm going to sit down and tell you, read it, highlight it, then yeah. come back and buy me a coffee. Then I'll help you. So yeah. it is that baseline. But secondly, in Australia, financial advice, it can be expensive. And I want this to be the link between not having financial advice, getting your own house in order, then being almost gift wrapped, ready to get financial advice. So it's a it's an easy entry to get some professional advice um, because there's no point seeing a financial advisor if you don't have your ducks in a row. Like sure, you can see a financial advisor if you don't have your ducks in a row, but they might charge you more to help you get those ducks in a row. So, mm. you know, mm. being an advisor, so many people would come to me saying, oh, hey, Glenn, I want some financial advice. I want to invest. Well, it's like, well, hang on, I just need you to do X, Y, Z first, then absolutely we can get the best value out of this relationship. So that's kind of one part of it, a stepping stone between uh, not knowing anything and seeing a professional. Uh, but then what I did in the book, I really wanted to um, help people get out of debt because debt cripples and consumer debt I'm talking about, like car loans, personal loans, credit cards, afterpay, all that crap that cripples society. Uh, so we talk about getting out of debt first 
And I even write in the book, if you're not in debt, well, like in life, if you're not in debt in life, you can skip people who are in debt. So like in the book, if you're in debt, if you're not in debt, you can skip the first chapter. So life will reward you either in the book or in real life. Yeah. Uh, and then we move into mindset. So I really wanted to throw everything I had uh, with my own journey of changing my money mindset. And I kind of, a lot of entrepreneurial books and, you know, get rich books and all that crap. It talks about from a mindset of, oh, you can buy the Ferrari, you can buy the private jet, you can, you know, fill the arenas and all this entrepreneurial stuff. And to me, that's a bit yuck. Mm. Uh, so I've really written it for somebody who might just have a job, might just go to work and want to do better. So, mm. excuse me, it's not just about this, everyone's got to have a big business and an empire. So we really get into the mindset of day to day. Then we move into um, how to structure our finances and in what order. Then we talk about investing. Uh, we talk about buying property first, home to live in or first investment property. We talk about superannuation and really understanding those concepts because everybody is an investor if they have a superannuation account. Then we talk about insurances, life insurances and all that stuff because that's so important. Then I just finish up with a whole heap of money myths, um, <laughs> hacks, you know, all random stuff. And it's, uh, it was a lot of fun. So that's kind of, yeah, I've maybe covered maybe 13, 13 uh, chapters <laughs> in that little summary, but uh, yeah. it's, it's certainly a big book. It, it is. It covers a lot. And something I want to, um, uh, something you touched on that I want to come back to is the fact that you started first with, um, dealing with debt and developing a money mindset. Why is that so important to tackle first before you dive head first into ASX? Yeah, that's right. Because we need to, one of the premises of the book um, is building a sound financial house. And I talk about the book, you know, where I am, I live two streets away from a beach and there's always a lot of construction down there, right? Now, when you build a house, you need strong foundations. And sometimes um, when they build properties around here, the foundations have to be really deep because it's sand and a lot of time has to go into building those solid foundations where down the road, there might be a normal block on suburbia. The foundations might not need to be as deep or as costly, but we know there is a common thing and that's having solid foundations. And if the homes on the beach didn't have solid foundations, it won't last and it's more costly to do huge repairs to a property if the foundations aren't in place like it's actually cheaper in the long run and required by law to have good foundations so in our own life we need to have solid foundations before we start to invest before we start to worry about you know going on a yoga retreat in india and all this stuff and all this fulfillment stuff um, and one of those foundations is getting out of consumer debt and having the mindset that I'm unplugging from this consumerism thing. I'm unplugging from buy now, mm. pay later. I'm having a lean and agile spending plan. And I even say like one of my first steps, I think I do a five steps to get out of debt. The first step is you've actually got to decide to, that you want to be out of mm. debt and you want to be out of debt for good because there's no point and I certainly wouldn't do it. Like why waste all your energy for the first two months trying to get out of debt and then relapsing? It's just like, it's a waste. So you have to hit rock bottom. And it's almost like a lot of people who might have had issues in their life, you know, and I'm talking, you, know, you see on the movies and all that, people with substance abuse issues. It's like, well, like, we can't do the intervention. We can't really help them until they've hit rock bottom. So we have to hit yeah. our own rock bottom and be done with consumer debt first then we've decided and that's also a mindset thing that i'm not doing consumer debt anymore i'm just not so mm. i don't know where i was going with that but it's a big thing to to get your ducks in in a row and also having an emergency yeah. fund um because it's all well and good that you've invested a thousand dollars every couple of months into an investment but if you have an emergency and you need three thousand dollars fast for some emergency dental repair or something like that we don't want to have to sell the investment and 
if that happened last year during the Corona um, first dip of the stock market, if you had to sell the investment, you would have sold at a loss. So it's yeah. just a wild time. We just have to do things yeah. in order the right way. Yeah, real life happens and it's important to have a, a bit of a safety net uh, before you before you start moving on. I really liked the idea of the, the house and the foundation and it was a really interesting visual. Um, and I think it really helped me understand that, you know, you're at the building blocks, mother housing. <laughs> Another yeah. housing metaphor, um, the building blocks of getting yourself ready um, to take that step of, okay, now I'm actually going to start investing over here. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start saving for a property. If you have that laid out first, then, you know, if life throws something at you, whether that's a health emergency or a pandemic or um, your car breaks down and you need to get it fixed, you, you aren't back to square one. Yeah. You know, things don't fall up, fall down around you. So yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a really interesting visual that I'd never come across before. Yeah, and that visual was the cornerstone of my advice process when I had a financial planning firm. So a client would come in, all right, where are we at? This is the sound financial house. Like with construction, a lot of the time, the the most time, the most structural engineering stuff is the stuff that you can't actually see ever. Like there's no point paying all this money to have a nice gable roof from the mid century or whatever it is. If your foundations suck, well, who cares? Because it's not going to last. Mm, yeah. Um, and I want uh, something I was thinking about as I was reading um, the book and the chapter, the first chapters on, on dealing with debt was that, you know, is there, is there a mental health element, you know, to, to dealing with debt and developing that money mindset? You know, I think, you know, if, if you are going through that process and you're looking at your, your statements and you're realizing, you know, the hole you might have dug for yourself, that could be, um, uh, that could put you in a bit of a hole yourself. You might feel really bad. But if you use those tools, those steps that you outline in the book, is that a way to kind of tackling that and coming out the other side and putting yourself in not just a financially healthier position, but a mentally healthier position as well? Yeah, I think uh, debt and mental health could be a huge problem. I know I've spoken publicly, I've had my own mental health issues, I'm medicated yeah. and, and all that. But I think what I want to get at is look at these steps to get out of debt, then give yourself a bit of a, an analysis. And if you can't crack it, if you keep, excuse me, if you keep overspending, if you look back and think, oh, the times I've had a blowout um, is when I haven't been happy or I haven't been myself and I needed to buy something and mm. to feel good. And I've had to do that with credit. I've had to do that on impulse. Mm. And it's the same movie played over and over again. I would encourage anybody to speak to their GP and even have a session with a psychologist. There's mental health plans because it may be a clinical issue that you are not yourself. So you're not behaving uh, in a way that's good for you and your money long-term. So, and I really mm. did touch about that. I touch on that topic in the book because it's a real problem. And I just want people mm. at the very least, if they think there might be a problem, just chat to your GP. And I think if you, if you sit down and you look at things objectively, the way you, the way we spend money, the way we save money, when we spend money, when we save money and what we spend it on can tell us a, a lot about ourselves and who we, who we really are. Um, and something that um, in terms of the mindset uh, as well, and it's sort of the mental setup for building that strategy, you know, when you're going through those steps of you're dealing with your, your commercial debt, um, it's not just one pillar. I sort of saw it the way you described it as sort of four pillars, uh, yep. mindset, habits, passion, and purpose, and how they, they kind of all come together. And, that, and this, is, this is all happening even before you started talking about uh, investments. And Absolutely, I thought it was, yeah a really solid way to approach it. Can you, can you tell, talk more about, you know, how, how these four pillars kind of contribute to setting yourself up for success or if not success, uh, a positive financial journey? Yeah, because I think mindset, it's so fascinating. And even like I really talk about, and I like how you broke that up and you've looked through that lens. I haven't seen it with a different mindset pillar. So thanks for that. I'll, I'll re-listen to this again. But um, <laughs> It's almost like the mindset thing, right? It's here's a thought exercise for everyone listening. Um, if you could start a side hustle or a new career uh, with an with the view to make 
as much money as possible and to have a good lifestyle. That's the objective, right? Make lots of money, have a good lifestyle, live life on your own terms. And we've got two options. The first option is just to follow our passions. And because everyone says, follow your passion, follow your passion. Awesome. You can do that. Or, and this is where the mindset comes in. Do we focus on what we're good at and what we enjoy? Because I've got a passion for driving my boat around the lake. Absolutely. It's a passion. I've got a passion for just got kayaks, kayaking. But if I followed my passion, there's a, a real, there's a, there is a small percent chance that I can turn that into a big empire. But if I just want to do a side hustle, I focus on what I'm good at and what I enjoy. It doesn't have to be the same as passion. So a lot of the time, you know, we can get caught up with, it's good to follow my passion. Or I'm like, absolutely, I agree. But if the objective is to make money and make a career out of it, you may need to just revert one step down and go, oh, I'm really good at this and I don't mind it, well, let's drive a truck through that direction. Yeah. I think sometimes it, this, this idea of, you know, follow your passion and make that your career, you know, it's not the only approach. Um, and, and another philosophy that I've seen it, and that kind of came through with this was setting yourself up so that you can have your passion and not, not, ha not have to build a business around it if you don't want to. Just have it be your passion and, you know, enjoy it for what it yeah. is. Yeah. And I think it's funny as we just like dig down this hole that we're kind of chatting about, it's cool to have these thought exercises because if I yeah. just do what I'm good at, do what I enjoy, I know I can make lots of money that might actually yes. enable me to do my passion without any pressure to make money from it. Mm -hmm. So if I do what I'm yeah. good at, do what I enjoy three days a week, I've set that system up in a way that, Oh, I can have two days off a week just to do my passion. So yeah. it's, um, it's very interesting. And that comes back to what you said earlier, which is life on your own terms, living, living life on your own terms. And when you spoke about this in the book, it was only, um, it was, it was an interesting section for me and it's something I'd like to dive into a little bit more because it was sort of put into comparison with FIRE, um, yeah. uh, financial independence, retire early, which is a term I've seen a lot on, you know, the reddits and the online spaces and the articles. And it's, to me, looking at it, uh, it seems like a really intense approach to life. Yes, the idea is that, you know, you, you can spend the rest of your, you know, um, prime living days, prime living years, enjoying yourself, but it just seems so restrictive. And then, um, so I was really interested about your philosophy of loot, life on yeah. your own terms. So why would you encourage people to, to maybe think about the loot approach as opposed to, to FI, if this is something they're interested in? Yeah, it's a very interesting topic and every time i open my trap about this i get a lot of weird comments on reddit that you know glenn's an anti-fire <laughs> and all this stuff and it's like i don't actually care what anyone does this is just how i see the world mm. where the fire yeah. movement started um so you amass enough wealth so if you needed a thousand dollars a week to live on so we'll call it 50 grand a year after tax the fire movement was amass as much wealth as you can, that that wealth would spit out 50 grand a year, $1,000 a week or whatever. So you didn't have to rely on work as your source of income. That was the premise of it. And I say, well, why wouldn't you? Because, yeah, so when people get to that time, they go, then we work on our, our cause they end up doing their side hustle and all that anyway. I'm like, well, what about we get our money in order now, get out of debt and start to go, well, I'm not going to continue doing a job I hate for the next 10 or 20 years to build up that wealth. Why don't I just rejig it and get out of debt, get my money systems in order and start to live life on my own terms now. And then mm -hmm. the circular logic with the fire thing is because I would be considered part of the fire movement. Like I've kind of doing what all the fire people want to do. Like I've got heaps of money. I work when I want and all this stuff. So it's like, okay, so I am living a life on my own terms. If I met the fire strategy, because a lot of the fire community were like, once I get fire, then I will do this. Once I get to fire, mm. then I will, where I'm like, no, I'm going to do this now 
because I still like working. I still like having an input and exerting my human capital and, you know, turning my time into money or whatever. So I'm saying, well, let's just bring that forward now and live life on your own terms from now. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's the, the issue with a lot of things online and communities is the dogma attached to it. And yeah. there's all yeah. these subcategories. So I would be considered fat fire, which is I spend heaps of money and enjoy life where you can do a lean fire, which is, um, yeah, I'm really strict on what I spend and I just saving as much as possible. And yeah, I'm just like, well, whatever, just do life on your own terms today. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it really should be whatever suits you, like the individual, their circumstances, their goals, uh, and that sort of thing that I didn't even realize there was multiple versions there of, is. of fire like, yeah. as well. Yeah. They've, they've got one that's like uh, barista fire and bloody, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's too wild to me. And, and this is the thing, people yeah. want to belong to a community and that fire movement has um, yeah. a, allowed people to belong to that. And, but then the yeah. dogma gets in and, um, you know, I've copped criticism for saying it's okay to have a superannuation account with under 1% in terms of fees where someone will be like, no, that's ridiculous. You can't pay more than, you know, 0.25%. It's like, well, mm. what's, it's no different than, you know, I spend $50 a week on cafes. Well, that's actually impacting my long-term investment outcome just like mm. fees are. So it's just like, just do you want, do whatever you want on your own terms. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild. So that's why I kind of, I did poke the bear a little bit with the fire movement, but I, I would say I, I am part of the fire movement. Um, I just don't think retire early. Well, I retired from the workforce when I was 25 years old and that's when I started my own business because I've, you know, I don't set an alarm in the morning. Like that's my definition of success. Mm. Like I never set an alarm and yeah. it's just do whatever you want to do. That's I, mean, I think that's probably why I like the idea of life on your own terms, because it seems um, less dogmatic, potentially less restrictive, more flexible. Yeah. And as we've seen in the last couple of years, real life happens. And sometimes you have to pivot. Sometimes you have to do things a little bit differently. And, you know, you can, you can plan the next 50 years out that life happens. That's right. Uh, and so I, I guess I kind of see it as a variation or maybe loot is the, is the overarching mm. sort of philosophy. And then you have all of these different fires that come under it. And as long as it's working for that individual, mm. uh, but and you're like, happy, I hope. Yeah. Well, and I legitimately have met people who, and they're in America because it came out of the States and yes. um, yeah. they're, and I'll be honest, I think it's a lot easier in the States because home prices are cheaper. Mm. Like you can buy a house for a hundred grand, yeah. like um, that are literally have heaps of money saved and don't work are in their late thirties, early forties and don't work. And they just, you know, do hobbies, do a bit of volunteering, do skiing and awesome. That's awesome. But for me, my brain would rot and I need purpose. And mm. so most of us, we need purpose. We need, like, if we had to not work, we would get bored. A lot of us would. There are people who wouldn't, but a lot of us would get bored. And I'm mm. saying, don't wait until you're quote unquote fire before you start your next project, bring it forward and bloody start it today. Yeah. And, and start setting yourself up, start looking, start looking at those investments and start generating that sort of incremental income and that future that's going to fund your, your, your later years. So you don't have to potentially work as much so that you can work when you want to, or if you want to. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so the, speaking of uh, investing, I'm going to move on to investing now. Sure. Um, the, something that really stood out to me was you talk about having the mindset of an investor, not a saver. What's the difference between them? I'd really love to know because I, I think I definitely have the mindset more of a saver. Yeah. Well, it was probably a bit more um, for the spenders. And I touched right. in the book, like, if you do an analysis, whether you're a spender or a saver. Um, so for me, I suck at saving money. Like, if there's cash there, it grows legs. It's weird. I'll either buy crap for my boat. I'll either give it away. I'll, who knows? It just disappears. For us out there who are spenders, we've just got this art 
of making money disappear. We have a lot of fun along the way, but we're really crap at saving money because we always find stuff to spend. So I had to change my mindset to be, okay, well, I've got my foundations in place. Now I'm an investor and I'm really good at investing. And I know now that once money commits over to my investment account, it stays there. And I only sell it down when I need to later in life. And for me, I sell my investments generally never. Like that's just my whole thing. So I had to change my mindset that once this money is committed to the investment account, it's gone from Glenn getting his mitts on it to buy something fun. It's gone from Mm. getting my mitts on it and buying a nice, you know, something to share with friends. Like, so for you, I would probably, uh, and the savers, because if you're really good at saving, the thing is, okay, well, how do we turn that mindset into an investor if I'm a saver? Well, we would do a bit of a, a goals thing and work out, okay, so over the next three to five years, what do I actually need this cash for? And it could be, well, I only really need 10 grand because I want to buy a new car. I, I need $5,000 because I want to go overseas in two years. And I've got $20,000 saved. So I've got a spare $5,000. Well, I need to actually put that to work for the long term because I don't need it in my day to day. So it can go to work. And we won't make our money, quote unquote, from the investment markets. You don't really start, really start to see returns, significantly compounding returns until your account balance is over a hundred thousand dollars. So, and we can get into the, the reasons why, but so that means, okay, if I've got $20,000, 15,000 is spoken for that $5,000 needs to go to work. And it's just considered a long-term savings account, which is an investment, which has a higher chance of growth. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way to put it because as a saver, I suppose I'm pretty risk averse and, you know, the idea of investment is exciting, but it's also, you know, it feels riskier. Saving yep. might be, um, you know, you have less potential growth, but it feels so safe. And I like to see, yeah, I wish they all had graphs. I think all apps should have graphs so you can see that, you can see that trend line. I, I would really appreciate that um, just personally. Yeah. Uh, but I think that as I was reading your book, it helped me feel a little more comfortable with the idea of, okay, this is just a different type of long-term saving. You know, in the short term, you might see a bit of volatility, but the idea is that it's something that you you approach with a long-term lens and you don't touch it and you just keep an eye on it. Yeah. And a lot of the time, what we fear and any um, thoughts that we may have or we're scared or don't know, it's just the unknown. And this book will help people understand like even on page 180, uh, write this down, everyone. Um, I, I talked about buying shares is just like gambling, quote unquote, because how many times have you seen online or family members say, I don't invest in shares. That's just like gambling where I unpack it. It's like, well, let's just back the truck up. You know, if I'm buying shares in a portfolio that includes Woolworths, you know, uh, West farmers, like your Bunnings and all that stuff or Coles and all the banks, I'm buying a percentage of that company. Now, gambling is a game of chance. Me investing into a company that has a long track record pays profits every six months. That's not gambling. So I really just dispel a lot of those myths as well. And when I wrote this book, I went to the My Millennial Money Facebook group and said, hey, everyone, what do you see out there that's missing from personal finance books? Mm. And I aggregated all the information and I just wrote this book to include everything that people said that weren't in everyday personal finance books. And that was one of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a, it's a really good intro to, to the ideas of investment and but there's, there's still quite a lot of detail in there as well. So, you know, if you, if you, for people who are sort of more, you know, earlier on in their journey, like myself or people who are a little bit further along, I think that there is something for everyone to, to get something out of this. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think, oh, sorry. Uh, you know, you go. <laughs> that's all right. 
Yeah, and what I kind of did, I, I wrote it, you know, there's two chapters on in, like investing in shares, chapter five uh, yeah. and then chapter six. Chapter five is the theory behind it. Uh, so we just talk about, you know, all the theory and terms and whatnot. And chapter six is practical where I do the case studies and whatnot. My view for this book was to make it a little bit more intermediate so people can start, understand a little bit, maybe go and set up their own investment account and play around mm -hmm. and then come back once they've listened to podcasts, once they've learned more, then reread my analysis of some of the charts and companies and then start to be able to learn again because, yeah, it, it is quite intermediate, uh, some of the parts that I talked about because I know a lot of my community um, are looking for that extra level of uh, knowledge and particularly around the superannuation and, you know, we got into the weeds about asset allocation and how um, the regulations in Australia are bloody muddy and it's hard to understand them at the best of time. So, yeah, it, it really is more a let me show you the concepts, let me teach you so you can make your own decision. That's kind of my vibe. Yeah, I definitely think it's it's worth multiple rereads and as you come back to it, as the words start to become more familiar as the term, as we understand the terms better, you, you, I think I'll notice more. So I'll, I'll definitely be rereading this as I as I go along. Uh, and I think uh, I'm probably not the only person in this in this boat, you know, if I'm making a wild assumption, like with the pandemic and everything and with less travel, um, you know, I think people are probably looking for more ways to make their money work harder or something to, to do with it that's going to benefit them, you know, long term, and they might start with shares and investing. So I wanted to hear from you, what is the number one mistake that people make when they start investing? They look at stuff that is not diversified. They look at stuff that may be single mm -hmm. stock. They start to think they have to pick stocks. Um, and that was kind of the garden path that I lead people down. I share, mm. uh, there's a coroner's report in the book. Uh, yes. <laughs> that we do a review on. <laughs> the what on, not to do. <laughs> the what not to do. So I shared in the book uh, my first investment into shares and how it was a disaster. And it's almost like the coroner, quote unquote, in the report said, just do the opposite of everything Glenn did when he was 18. So the first thing I would say is, uh, get invested. You want to make sure you're diversified. It might be getting a, an app like Raise or Spaceship or just something that, or, you know, a Vanguard fund that's already pre-mixed, already diversified. And I show you in the book, all those concepts, because uh, you don't have to pick an individual stock. You don't have to go, oh, I want to invest. Do I choose CBA or ANZ or do I do Woolworths or Coles? Like, no, no, we just have to spread the risk and understand what the index is, understand how to invest in a low cost index. And I really think the book does that. And I don't know if you saw in the book um, and if you didn't, that's all good, but I showed an example of, you know, using diversified, two diversified funds. And then on the chart, I put yes. CBA in. And then as a kicker, I put Westpac in and I showed you that if you were picking individual bank stocks, well, if you pick the wrong bank, you would have done worse than a diversified portfolio. So mm. I just thought that was fascinating because I, I just like charts because I'm a visual learner. So yeah, I, I really thought that yeah. was very interesting. So is, is that the gamble then? If you're not picking diversified, you're gambling that you're making, you're making the right choice. Whereas if you're diversified, you're spreading your risk out uh, and it's going to be more beneficial and, and more, uh, more safe long-term. Yeah, I would probably step back and say, if you're picking individual companies, the mm -hmm. data is against you. So in the book, I shared mm -hmm. that there was a, a thing and everyone can look at the Spiva scorecard. And that's from a website, mm -hmm. smpglobal.com. Uh, over the last five years, um, active fund managers, which are fund managers who random, like don't randomly, they, they actively pick individual shares to build a portfolio versus if they just copied the index and I won't get into the index, you'll have to read the book, but there's this thing that only 20% of fund managers who were active, so actively looking, beat the market, beat the index. So if professional fund managers have only a 20% chance of doing better than just buying the top 200 companies, the data is against you to individually pick individual stocks because 
you're not a fund manager. Mm. You're not an economist. Like you, like I don't even do that because I know I've got, I've got no bloody idea what individual companies do, and I've got better things to do than try and read and decipher reports. So, I think we just need to understand diversification. Uh, and even mm. in the book, I, I think I talked about, you know, what's more diversified, a single share of ANZ stocks, a portfolio of two banks. Yes, it is more diversified but you're still within the same sector. So banking or, and then you're still yeah. in the same country, but then you need to really just ramp it up and, and spread the risk. Yeah. So even if, if something hits the, that sector, yeah. even if you've diversified your companies, you could still be, you could still be at risk there. That's right. Yeah. The, the other thing you touched on earlier was those apps, uh, raise and, and spaceship. And I'm, are they a bit of a new phenomenon? Because I've really seen them come up in the last couple of years. And is it a sign of the times in terms of Australia in particular? Yeah, it's, um, they are kind of, I guess, over the course of time and human history, quite new. Uh, but I, I think I shared in the book that when I was 18, it would have been awesome to have that. So we're at this point now where technology is really helping us uh, with ease, accessibility, a low barrier to entry. So you don't have to save up $2,000 anymore where you can get one of these apps and just start contributing small amounts to start to understand how markets move. Like even if you put a hundred dollars in one of those accounts and didn't do anything other than looked at it every couple of days, just to see that, Oh, one day my accounts at $98. Oh, what I've lost money or, Oh, my accounts at $110. Oh, it's moved 10%. So it's just a really good way to get your foot in the door. And people also say, oh, when should I graduate from these micro investing apps? And isn't there an old saying like, the teacher will appear as soon as the student's ready or something like that. Like you will, <laughs> you will automatically outgrow that the more you learn about investing. Yeah, because I've, I've got a, a raise and I've been finding it really interesting, as I mentioned before, with if, you, if you're not familiar with investing, if you've got more of that savings mindset of seeing the graph and it's mm. almost comforting to see it, yes, while there is volatility, volatility maybe in the short term, it, it, there is that longer term growth and it's almost like a, a microcosm of, of what investing could be at a, at, a, at a larger scale or through a Vanguard or something like that. And I loved you know, with all the detail you put invest in, in the investment chapters, it's probably my first exposure to, to a lot of the terms and to a lot of those sorts of funds. And I think I really appreciated just getting that kind of overview in a, in a very non-judgmental way, but mm. with enough information that, as I said earlier, I, I can come back to this and as, as I progress in my own journey as a, and as any reader progresses in their own journey, they'll find more yeah, and they'll and be able to continue. And my hope with any of the stuff I teach is that you outgrow what I'm doing because I can only take people so far, then you need to get your own professional advice specific to your situation. Then you might learn more mm. and turn it up a notch uh, because yeah, you, you really can't give all things to all people. And that's why I kind of had to kind of stay at beginner into intermediate because if you get to advanced, well, number one, your readership uh, scope gets smaller. And then as the more advanced you get, the more that you do need to consider personal situations, which I can't do in a book anyway. So, yeah. and that's why it's the link between um, use this book to get out of debt, get your money mindset in order, get invested in a practical way. Then, mm -hmm. You know, once you've got your emergency fund done, once you're out of debt, once you've got your systems in place and you've got a spare X amount per month coming in, then it's worth investing in personal financial advice. Absolutely. Mm. So, Glenn, what do you hope readers will take away from sort your money out and get invested? I just want them to take away one thing. And I guess uh, as an umbrella over that, I want people to take away encouragement and confidence like so that's all i want but then just look for the one thing uh and i've set that bar low probably for my own um i don't know just don't want to try and solve everyone's problems but just like it's a simple thing right like if someone pays 30 dollars for a book um if you learn one thing and implement that one thing and commit to it that 30 dollars could 
save you thousands of dollars over the course of your life. So that's why just take the pressure off when you're reading this and just go, I've invested $30. Let me find that one thing to get that value back from. And I would say that with any book um, and get a highlighter. I wrote in the front of it that I want to give your primary school librarian a heart attack when he or she sees <laughs> that the pages are dog-eared and there's text are all over the book. Um, just get dreaming. I want you to just use this book to change the trajectory of where your money mindset is at. So it just comes back to one thing. I'm going to get encouraged. I'm going to be empowered. I'm going to just start to move in a direction. I want the train to leave the station. We just need some movement. And I really hope this book um, will do that for a lot of people. And I must say, Sam, when I first, and I really want to thank Wiley, like I'll show you here, when they approached me, there's a book here and we don't need to name it. See the size of that book? Uh, it's like 50,000 words, right? And I, they said, yeah, your book will be like this one, this size. Uh, so do 50 to 60,000 words. I, I went to New Zealand because I smashed this out in six weeks, right? It was hell, but it was craziness. For the first three weeks, I just locked myself in a, a thing in New Zealand and just wrote and wrote and wrote. And I called them at 60,000 words and I said, hey, this is, I'm not finished. I need words. And I said, just keep going. We'll make it work. And we submitted over 95,000 words and you can wow. see how much bigger the book is. Yeah. You've got your copy there. Yep. Um, <laughs> so it really is such a chunky book and seriously, I'm just so thankful because when you go with a publisher, right, there is this thing, and I hope Wiley aren't listening. Ah, oh, they can listen. They're all good. I love them. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's this thing with a publisher, right, where I've walked into the first couple of meetings like, all right, we need to do this. Can I do this? I want this. And they're like, well, no, this is, you know, this is the book world and this is how it works. You'll get a book this size. And, you know, when I first had a goal in mind for a book, weirdly, it was a square book this big and it ended up this size. And I yeah. wanted, I didn't want the, um, the normal kind of br uh, like off white paper, like in a novel, I wanted it more white. Um, and I got like, what exactly was in my yeah. head. And I don't know if people are into manifesting or any of that stuff, but pretty much we ended up what was always in my heart. And even to the point, and this is how thankful I am to them. I even, you know, their little logo. I said, I didn't want that on the front cover because it's not going to work with the design. <laughs> like they even, they even <laughs> let me. So my designer did the cover and, you know, it was just such a, I can't thank Wiley enough for um, this partnership that, you know, they yeah. helped me bring this book to life and it's just a fascinating journey. So thank you so much, Wiley. And uh, thank you to Booktopia because you guys have really got behind it and, you know, you've helped our listeners out because a lot of people are buying multiple copies and uh, yeah, Booktopia has been really good. Love it. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic resource. It is a tome, as you, as you say, there's so much packed into it. Um, and, you know, I can't thank you enough as well. You know, this I'm going to be definitely rereading this again and again. Uh, and, you know, Glenn, just congratulations on the book. It's a, it's a, it's a big deal uh, and it's, it's going to be uh, a really important for a resource for a, a lot of your readers, a lot of the community, and even more. I, I absolutely know this for sure. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today and to our listeners, thank you for listening. You can order a copy of Sort Your Money Out and Get Invested right now at booktopia.com.au. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces, and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast, and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, 
Australia's local bookstore at booktopia.com.au.